Welcome, everybody. So thank you so much for joining, Tracy. Oh, you look so, I love your backdrop. I, so awesome. Love yours. Thank you. So I just wanted to give a little intro. My name is Brooke Jaffe. I'm hosting, um, we're sort of in the beginnings of what we hope to be a very dynamic discussion about what inspires us through art um, here with the incredible community of art Art, art news. Um, Tracy Reese is kind of a legend. You've been in fashion for so long with your namesake collection of Tracy Reese, plenty. Um, people know you, you have a lot of influence in this industry and now are using that influence with this new sustainable collection, Hope for Flowers. So thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, excited <laughs> to have this conversation. Excited as well. And um, I am lucky to have known you throughout my career. Um, so let's just dive right in to this conversation. Hope for Flowers, your new collection, which is now two seasons in, um, is a sustainably based line. And when reading about you on more about this line on the blog, you mentioned four distinct artists that impacted the summer collection. Cy Twombly, Simone Lee, Elizabeth Catlett, and photographer Malik Sadib. Um, can you kind of talk to us about why those four and what that meant in terms of the designs? Sure, and you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, art always informs my work and I think it's just what I'm inspired by. I mean, there are tons of things that I'm inspired by, but I think because art is so visual and, um, so emotional, um, it's easy to sort of fall into, you know, using that as a constant source of inspiration. And, you know, starting with Simone Lee, I was so lucky and honored to meet her, um, thanks to Thelma Golden, actually, who's the, you know, chief curator and director at the Studio Museum of Harlem. And um, she's a dear friend of mine. And I was at her luncheon and Simone was being honored. And I'm not the type to usually step up to people and introduce <laughs> myself. I'm, you know, if you know me, you probably know that I'm on the more shy side, but I couldn't help myself. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so excited to meet you. And she was so gracious and she was like, oh, I love your work. And we had a nice conversation. And she said, you know, tomorrow I'm having a talk at the Guggenheim because she had an exhibition at the Guggenheim at the time and she was doing this incredible talk on Saturday morning and she said, I have two tickets left um, and they're mm -hmm. yours if you'd like to come. And I was like, oh my God, of course, <laughs> I'll be there. And I was lucky enough to go with Thelma and I, I took my notebook and I'm glad I did because it was a gathering of intellectuals and the level of conversation and education you know, was off the chain and I was <laughs> learning, you know, and taking yeah. notes. And I, I looked at Thelma, I was like, you know, my industry isn't half this deep. And she was like, <laughs> well, we use these conversations to inform our work. And, and she was going on and I'm like taking notes. I'm like, okay, thanks, Thelma. But um, what do you mean the fashion industry isn't deep? <laughs> <laughs> right? What do you mean? What do you so mean? Anyway, um, I'd been following Simone for a while and actually had stalked her a little bit outside of one of her, uh, outside of a gallery in Chelsea. And just love her work, love everything about it, love the, the tactile nature of it, love the message, you know, you name it. And <laughs> when it came to designing uh, summer 2020, I was really enthralled with these tiny rosebuds that she had created um, and used as adornment, as hair, on some of her sculptures. And I always love flowers, and I think, you know, flowers also inform a lot of, of what I do. And I looked at those shapes as sort of inspiration in terms of the shapes themselves, but also just the idea of rosebuds and the simple purity of, of the shape of a bud. Mm -hmm. um, with Malik Sabid, you know, the image that uh, was on my inspiration board is this, you know, couple dancing and it's a, it's a classic image. And I think the first time I saw it, I was in DC um, at
uh, particular image. And it's a, a couple dancing and their heads are together. And she's wearing like a fitted bodice, full skirt, white dress. And just the, the simplicity and the purity of the shapes and mm -hmm. the message that's communicated by the couple um, has always really struck me. And I love classic shapes. Yes. Um, black and white is like the, the start of almost every collection. And I think if you speak to a lot of designers, they'll, they'll say the same. So that was just about simplicity and purity. And after I designed a uh, part of uh, the story, I, I looked at the work and I thought, you know, there's another way that I can express the same idea. And I had a palette that I'd started with of like jade green and, you know, rich rose pinks and, you know, with neutrals to bounce off. And it was beautiful and bold in a very feminine way, but I felt like the styles could also be expressed in a more graphic way. And that's where the Elizabeth Catlett came in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, between her lithographs and sculptures, again, there's a certain simplicity and purity of line. Mm -hmm. There's a graphic quality um, that I really respond to, and it almost feels a little bit tribal, mm -hmm. um, but it's wholly American. And so just just how it made me feel and looking at those images um, sort of gave me the idea of moving into a more um, primary palette of like navies and reds and, and yellows and sort of making uh, the prints a bit more tribal. And it's interesting, the prints that I developed for the first part of the collection easily translated into a more uh, tribal expression. So, mm -hmm it was really like a, a, a fluid sort of um, transition into this kind of second palette and, and set of prints. So with this I Twombly, that was uh, another uh, wonderful chance thing. I went to, um, to see his work at the Gagosian Gallery, and that was probably about 18 months ago, maybe it was two years yeah. ago. I've lost track of time, as, as <laughs> have we all. I think we all have. <laughs> and, you know, before I, I went um, to see that exhibition, I wouldn't have called myself a Cy Twombly fan, mm -hmm. but I stayed there for hours just gazing at some of the works, and, you know, there, of course, there's a lot of scribble and it's very abstract, but at the same time, it was very emotional for me. And I saw flowers in so many <laughs> of the pieces. And um, I, I walked out thinking, oh my God, I didn't realize that I was a fan, but I am, you know? So again, sort of having um, a different view of things that I always love, you know, seeing them with a more abstract eye or from a more emotional um, standpoint um, is always a lovely way to sort of look at classic things anew and find a fresh way to express what I always love. Well, that's, I'm inspired just listening to you. I, I can't stop glancing at the wall behind you and it's taking me back when you mentioned your mood boards just now, and I'm, I'm, I'm going back to seeing your mood boards in real life and you create the most impressive, robust mood boards that it's it kind of, it's so, you're so inspired by and inspiring. Um, so let's talk about sustainability because this is obviously a really important idea right now, yet not many are brave enough to go down this path of designing sustainably as you have with Hope for Flowers. So with all of this inspiration, have you come across any challenges in terms of executing sustainable clothing while still you know, staying true to what you want to do? Right, it's definitely challenging. I mean, for me, um, it wasn't really about um, redirecting the ship that I was already steering, which was my old collection, Tracy Reese. It was about starting anew from scratch. And for all kinds of reasons, I think that the, that brand had sort of wound down organically. Mm -hmm. And 
I wanted to express myself differently. And the more that I was learning about sustainability and also just the damage that our, our industry, the fashion industry does um, in the world, the more I knew that I did not want to exist in this industry without doing it in a way that was less harmful to people and to the planet. Yeah. And so for me, it meant, you know, a clean break and a fresh start. And also practicing, you know, what we call slow fashion, and which for me means less product and fewer deliveries because we just don't need as much. And I think that, you know, we're in this cycle or have been in this cycle of extreme overproduction. And I feel like the, the customer is disillusioned. I mean, there's just so much of everything. Yeah. It's really difficult to understand the difference between products um, people don't know where stuff is made. Fast fashion has really, you know, kind of tainted things quite a bit, you know, in terms yeah. of how people value clothing. And, you know, we, I was raised in a different time. You know, we, we didn't have as much stuff and it got passed around. I mean, I have two sisters. We were three girls. I'm in the middle. And I remember friends of our family would send their eldest daughter's clothes to us and my older <laughs> sister Leslie would wear them and then I would wear them <laughs> then we would pass them on to my cousin Kim who's nine months younger than I am she was always smaller than me <laughs> and then they would come back to our house and my younger sister Erin would wear them <laughs> and that's that's how the good pieces were preserved and passed around especially you know pretty dresses and things like that it wasn't like oh, you're done with this, or it's worn out. Even our play clothes, though, those had a much harder life. But, <laughs> um, you know, the beautiful dresses and the things that, you know, I was really attached to and loved, um, they, they lived on, you know, yeah. in the family and among friends. And that's just, that was natural. And I remember, you know, my dad's old T-shirts we used to clean with. You know, they were... <laughs> You know, and and now people throw everything away, you know, and, and the idea <laughs> that so much clothing ends up in landfills is mind boggling to me. Yeah. I mean, the idea of throwing away clothing, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. But when you look at the, the quality of especially fast fashion these days, it, the quality is so poor that you would you would hate to see it. I mean, it's depressing to see you know, some of these labels hanging in, in secondhand stores because, yeah. you know, the items are, you know, passe trends, the fabrics are pilling and damaged and, and, and the quality is just so poor. And when we, you know, also begin to understand that our cast offs are, are being sent overseas they're being sent to, to Africa, to African nations and they're, they're, they're filling their markets or their markets are being filled with our secondhand cast offs, these poor quality items. And there's such a deluge of mm -hmm. junk yeah. that they can't even support their own fashion industries because they're inundated with our cast offs. You know, so not only are we filling landfills, we are creating these terrible economic situations in other countries you know yeah. we're shipping our garbage to the far east where you know the list goes on and on and it's like how can we how can we continue to function in this way you know just using this planet as our as our as our dump yeah you know yeah. and what will our children inherit and what what habits are we teaching our children when you know so much of what we use and buy into we treat as disposable or it's made to be disposable and you know just the whole idea of that of someone laboring to create something you know and not making a living wage through that work okay still living way below the poverty line and then you know that work being worn once or twice and then thrown away you know, I remember when I, I, I first started to travel to India, 
Um, and I was just amazed by all of the craft there and all the beautiful handwork and every community had a different specialty and there was just, it was just mind blowing. But I'd walk into factories and they were doing hours and hours and hours of handcraft on cheap polyester fabric. And I was like, yeah. why are you doing this on this fabric? And they were like, oh, you know, it just had become That's the way, you know? Yeah. And I was like, no, you know, this beautiful work deserves to be created on on equally beautiful textiles, you right. know? And I was like, you know, let's, let's use some beautiful cottons and silks. Let's not, you know, embroider on, on polyester. It just, you know, kind of blew my mind. But this is what, you know, Western, I, whatever, Western <laughs> ideas, you know, this is how they've translated all over the world, you know? Well, and by forcing this, you know, or... I guess this, we want everything so cheaply, you know, yeah. Yeah. and then it, and then it has no value to us, you know, after we've like beat the price down and we've exploited, you know, the workforce all over the world to get these cheap, cheap prices so that we can have more and more. Right. I don't know. It's, it's all kind of really distasteful. And after having been in the industry for 30 plus years, I was like, <laughs> You know, how do I want to, what do I want to stand for in this industry? And we never made uh, cheap clothing. No. But we did overproduce. You know, we were in that classic cycle that most department stores demand. You know, we, yeah. we shipped a minimum of 10 times a year. And a lot of stores wanted us to ship 12 times. And it's just like, it doesn't make any sense. You know, yeah. let's, let's hold it 10. And, you know... They couldn't even sustain that amount of, of, of product from some no. vendors, but that right. was always the push. You know, where's the next delivery? What's the next yeah. thing to do? You know, the and retailers started competing with the Zara's and the H and M's. Exactly, and they and also started demanding cheaper prices. I mean, we look at the deflation in price in women's wear, especially. Mm -hmm. It's mind blowing. I mean, when we were. Shipping plenty, we were shipping silk blouses, and the natural price would be about two hundred twenty-five dollars at retail. That's just how it fell out. Yeah, and I remember when stores started saying, "Oh, that's too expensive," you know. So we're like, "Okay," you know. So yeah. we we changed to rayon, and those blouses would retail for like maybe 128 158 so they still had all the same production value but we were using you know, viscose and then you know the stores came back and said well you know the magic price is 78 dollars retail because yeah. if if a customer comes in and she's she loves this blouse then she'll buy two or three instead of just one if it's $78 and I'm thinking to myself, well, why does she need two or three? Why not have one that's a decent quality that she loves and that she wears often? Why does she need to buy two or three? So everybody is like sipping the Kool-Aid, you know, yeah. and it just became this really dangerous, dangerous. It's a little bit of the Instagram culture of needing a new yeah. outfit for every photo. It's sort of the unrealistic expectation. I think a lot of, people feel that they need to be seen every time in something new and sort of this culture has sort of fed into that. But I want to shift gears, Tracy, back to a couple of things you said, because you talk about textiles just now and sort of the importance of, of quality. And that's something that I really think of when I think about you. I think of you, you know, both your prints, whether they're floral, the silhouettes that you've been inspired by are often very timeless clean, uh, graphic. I also associate your style with a certain um, bygone femininity and elegance in a way, um, sometimes even a reference to the 40s. Um, I don't know if I'm making that up, but that's, that's some, sometimes I feel that. Can you just opine a little bit about some, you know, why you're so drawn to floral motifs and some of these, you know, you've dressed the first lady. I think there's something just timeless and classic about your designs. And I'd love to hear why that, that speaks to you as an artist. Sure. 
and and let's be clear. I dressed Michelle Obama. I dressed yes, Michelle. Oh yes, lady. the former yeah. first lady. Let's <laughs> not. You. Yes, let's be clear. Um, and yeah, that's that's no further conversation. Details. <laughs> It's funny. Um, I've always loved flowers, but I think, too, it just goes back to nature. And I think, you know, nature naturally informs so much of what I love and what I love to do. And I find peace in nature. I find optimism. I see the future in nature. There's simplicity. It's interesting during, you know, the whole COVID crisis and all this time for contemplation, it's like, you know, I need to read Walden again. I need, I mean, there's, you know, we have to get back to simple things and simple pleasures and a, a, a simple way of living because we've overcomplicated life itself, you know, and it's, it's not to, it's not meant to be this complex, but you know, agree more. and um, when we talk about silhouettes, I love, I do love classic silhouettes. I don't, you know, and I, I like trends too. Trends can be super exciting and fun to play with. But at the end of the day, if you buy something from me, I hope you, you love it when you buy it. And I hope you love it two years later. And I hope you love it five years later. I hope it's still in good condition. And I hope you still have a reason to put it on. You know, so if we buy too heavily into trends, then it makes that difficult, you know? Yeah. So I, I've always looked better personally in classic silhouettes and I think, um, a lot of people who come to me, you know, for dresses, especially, um, tend to be flattered by more classic silhouettes. Yeah. So that one's pretty easy textiles. That's just, it's always been a love of mine. And I think, you know, when we talk about responsible design, it can be more challenging from this incredible wealth and plethora. Ooh, you froze for a second. Work within. Yeah. Did my, did my, did, did the words. You're back. You're back. Okay. Good. You've unfrozen. You're back. Your dynamic. You're okay. back. I was talking about textiles, yeah. And, you know, when you're designing responsibly, you can't just pick any beautiful textile you please. You no. really need to focus in on the things that are, are least harmful um, in terms of, you know, the growth of the fiber and the weaving process and the use of pesticides and the dyeing process. The list goes on and on. So it's a smaller um, group of fabrics that I'm working within and yeah. I'm thinking to myself okay that's okay because I can look at these and say how do I make this beautiful how do I elevate you know whether it's something that seems somewhat humble or something that is simple um, and my answer to that you know what I want to grow into and I'm still sort of establishing the supply chain for is that I want to add handcraft on top mm -hmm. of these um, very classic, simple, humble textiles. I mean, that's something that's sort of a signature for you. I mean, I'll, when I think back to your Plenty line, I always think of embellished collars. Like, there was so much detail. And so mm -hmm. I always feel like you augment the textile to the next level. Um, so I just want to talk about where you are right now, because you are in Detroit, Michigan. And you spent your entire career in New York City building a fashion brand there. So you know, maybe just quickly address why the move, what are you trying to do? Um, and are there any local artists to that community that you dream of working with? Right. You know, I'm from Detroit originally, but like you said, I, I lived in New York for 30 plus years. And when I decided to make this change, part of it was driven by um, wanting to be more active here in Detroit. Detroit has been undergoing like a slow renaissance over the past three years. And there's been a lot of, of, of injection of new life and energy, a lot of construction. Um, there's so many beautiful old homes here. And Detroit has always had a very rich cultural history, whether it's music or art or, or you name it. And I wanted to be a part of that in my hometown. And we're so close to New York, you know, it's like an hour and 15 minute flight 
I realized I could be here as often as I wanted to and also be close to family. So I purchased a home here and I started involving myself more in local issues, whether it was working, you know, a little bit with Detroit public schools or meet, meeting local artists, um, working, you know, not working, but supporting um, some of the galleries and museums here. And um, I decided I wanted to see if it was possible to produce a small domestic collection right here in Detroit, mm. because there are a few um, small factories between um, Detroit, Flint, Pontiac, um, all within driving distance. And there's just a lot of exciting stuff going on with, you know, people being trained in um, industrial sewing and, you know, just some really great nonprofits here that are doing good work. So I wanted to be involved and through that, be able to give back to my community and also, you know, create opportunities for young people. I mean, there are so many kids graduating from fashion programs across the country. And, you know, I, I always lament that there are so many more graduates than jobs, you know, in the industry. Yeah. I mean, it's That's... just, you know, it's mind boggling. Um, but it seems like you always have to leave home for your opportunity. Yeah. You know, and it's like, what, what can happen right here in Detroit? I mean, we have a history of manufacturing. So why not? Um, why? why not clothing? And as part of you know, decreasing my carbon footprint, the idea of being able to produce locally um, is mm -hmm. extremely uh, attractive. So I joined the board of NEST um, in January and NEST has a mission, you know, supporting artisans and craftspeople all over the world and helping people achieve, you know, economic independence through their art and their craft. And mm -hmm. um, they're launching a program here in Detroit, which I'm supporting called Makers United. And this is really about getting into the community and finding those artisans who are probably, you know, single person entrepreneurships, you know, working all mm -hmm. on their own, trying to launch um, their businesses or, or have some, you know, economic or some income, you know, from their work. And they need support and they need yeah. services. They need to be connected to people who might be interested in what they're doing, you know? So um, Makers United is really um, an incredible vehicle that is going to provide a lot of that support and connect people to support that's already available here in Detroit that they might not have known about. Makers United, so do they have a website that people can go check yes, out? Yes, if you go to buildanest.com, org um the makers united program is one of the many programs that they're running um or if you follow um nest on instagram mm -hmm. uh you can find more information about it but we're in the process of reaching out to artisans here in detroit uh, to get them enrolled in this program and it will launch digitally over the summer and, you know, based on what is happening with the, the virus, you know, there will be some in-person workshops and things, too, once that becomes possible. I love it. This is so great. And kudos to you. I mean, you're just, you're so inspiring. And it's really, it's really incredible, Tracy. Um, so I just want to move on because I, I want to run out, I don't want to run out of time. We've gone a little bit over, but I, I still want to ask you a few more questions here. You know, do, we've talked about this demand, especially that retailers are placing on designers and artists, whether it's galleries with artists, to just produce, produce, produce. You know, how, I like that you're trying to change that cadence um, to slow it down. Um, you know, but in this time of quarantine, you know, so much of the inspiration used to come from travel <laughs> and visiting places. So I just, you know, I'd love for you to just quickly touch upon how are you staying inspired at home right now? And maybe how do you, how do you, how do you get people to slow down with you? I mean, yeah. it's sort of a tough question, but. <laughs> really, in some ways, you know, because of COVID, I mean, the universe is asking us all to slow down. You know, we've been forced. And it's like, if, if we could just listen listen to that simple message. We've all been forced to slow down. It's not 
just this moment, it's this is the earth crying out for us to slow down. Yeah. Stop overproducing, stop living a sing life, um, become more yeah. reflective, um, become more community minded. Mm. Um, yes. And, and, and we can't make it alone. You know, we need each other. And I think this is also amplified that reality. It's like for those of us who've been somewhat isolated or been sheltering alone, there's mm -hmm. nothing more you would love right now than, than a hug and to, to be with your friends, you know? So the value of those simple relationships and our yeah. relationship to our community and, and to nature and all that, this is an opportunity to embrace all of that. So I'm hoping that, you know, a lot of people are, are listening to what the universe is really trying to tell us. You know, we have to take time to heal the planet and we have to heal ourselves from, you know, this, these, what is it, this like addiction to, mm. to stuff and to, of uh, finding gratification only in things. Couldn't agree so, more, Tracy. You know, that's, and I, and I think a lot of people are, are really hearing that. In terms of inspiration, you know, yeah, thank God for, for the internet and for Instagram <laughs> and, and for friends, but it's interesting, and, and I'm someone who's always taken inspiration from travel, but it's, it's nice to be here in Detroit and just take local inspiration and even, even to look back, you know, at work I've done in the past. And, you yeah. know, I think a lot of designers will agree with me. We, you know, we're always on to the next thing and we, we don't look back often and we kind of don't appreciate a lot of the work we've done in the past. And it's, it's time to sort of take stock and, and find the good and the best parts of that work um, because it, it defines, um, you know, who we are. And it can also um, inform, you know, the future. So yeah, I'm 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 looking out my window here on my backyard <laughs> and this big oak tree and you know there's inspiration everywhere. And one of my favorite quotes, you know, is Bill Cunningham. Remember in oh. the in the documentary, and he said, you know, if you seek beauty, you will find it. And it's like, it's, it's that simple. If you want to find oh. it, it's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Love Bill Cunningham. Um, all right. Well, I want to, why I want to start to close this, but I want to ask a couple art pointed art questions again, because we're here on art news. Um, I guess complete the sentence art is important because. Ooh, art is important because it opens your your mind and your heart to just so much of the beauty in the world and the talent that's out there and, and makes you want to be a part of it in some way. I love it. Tracy, I'm so thrilled that you could join us. I want everybody listening today to check out Tracy's awesome, sustainable collection of, of women's clothing, Hope for Flowers. Um, you know, you are an inspiration. You are also... I, you know, we went a little bit over, but you are just such a lovely, wonderfully grounded person and you don't shout from the rooftops. You never have. And I just, I'm so excited to have this opportunity to speak to you today because it's not easy to find um, in the industry. Although I feel we're, we're slamming the fashion. Fashion is wonderful. <laughs> it is wonderful and it's fun and it makes us feel good. And Thank you, Brooke, for having me, for remembering me, and for amplifying Please. my voice and allowing me to be on this this beautiful uh, Instagram live telecast. Absolutely. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, you everybody, for joining, and we'll be back soon.